This town hall is a presentation of Sinclair Cares. Thanks for joining us for this Sinclair Cares Town Hall. I'm Dee Dee Gatton with the National Desk, and there is a critical issue we'd like to address today, and it's one that impacts one in two American families. It's the need for a basic necessity for babies and toddlers, diapers. Our partner on this important call for action is the National Diaper Bank Network, which reports that 5 million babies and toddlers under age 3 live in poor and low-income families. Throughout this town hall, we'll keep this QR code up on your screen. Just scan that QR code or go to SinclairCares.com to help local diaper banks provide diapers to children and families in need or reach out if your family is struggling with basic needs for your baby. Now let's begin in Maryland, where a Baltimore nonprofit is on a mission to help the city's most vulnerable. Through distributing diapers and other essentials, they've helped thousands of families in need. Maxine Stryker with our sister station in Baltimore has more on their impact. Tucked away along Union Avenue is a little warehouse packed full of love. When an item reaches our warehouse, 99% um, of the time it's back out in the community within 30 days. Executive Director of Share Baby, Amina Weiskerger, says their operation has grown tenfold since they got started in 2014. At the time, three new moms with extra baby items to donate were looking for a way to give back. They couldn't find a simple way to donate items free of charge and to make sure they were st staying in the Baltimore community. So they started Share Baby. Share Baby is a baby pantry packed with diapers, wipes, clothing, and just about any baby product you can think of. Built a pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> it's all donated by the community and given to the most vulnerable in Baltimore. And we're really just there to um, help children have what they need the most in order to help families be more successful. On a monthly basis, 200,000 diapers and other essentials are given to more than 15,000 Baltimore children. Community-based organizations help distribute the items by coming to the warehouse and shopping for the families they serve. There is this need and this want to take care of your children and to make sure they're okay. And when you can't do that for your children, um, not only is it stressful for the child that doesn't have what they need, but it's an incredible amount of stress and anxiety for the mother, for the caretaker of that child. Two, four, six, they eight, rely on eight, volunteers. Eight, wrapping diapers by size and packages of 25. Like Margie. Right, and I can count to 25 really fast. <laughs> to get the job done. You can see they work really hard and they're providing assistance all over the community. Chrissy Ripley says the organization speaks to the generosity of the Baltimore community. That's the greatest gift you can do is give back. Especially to a mother in need. I think it's important that we as a community come together because there's vulnerable community members that are not given the basic necessities such as diapers as young you know as moms you know we know how difficult it is to provide for our babies and not being able to just have the basic essentials is very devastating and scary, to be honest with you. In Baltimore. And it feels good to help. Maxine Stryker. That was our Sinclair strength from our sister station in Baltimore. And, and now we would like to introduce our first two guests. Joining me here in studio, Joanne Goldblum, CEO and founder of the National Diaper Bank Network. And joining virtually, Dr. Megan Smith, board member of the National Diaper Bank Network. Thank you both for being with us. Joanne, starting with you, we know that this is a cause you are so passionate about. You know, your organization recently releasing this startling information here that nearly half of families report diaper need this year. Uh, in, in 2010, we understand it was one third of families. What do you think is potentially making things worse? We you know, like you said, had this study that had always said one in three, one in three American moms or American parents just described this. And this time when we learned it was one in two, well, it was really, really 
horrifying. It's a, it's a horrible statistic. It wasn't that surprising. You know, the fact is that more than 40% of American children are poor or low income. More than 40% of the births in the United States are paid for by Medicaid. There are all of these signs that show we are in a really difficult place when it comes to children and poverty. Um, and another thing I think that's really important and the reason that we might have heard that one in two number is inflation. You know, the, the cost of um, goods has gone up exponentially, mm -hmm. but wages haven't kept pace, mm -hmm. especially when we look at the fact that minimum wage remains $7.25. The federal minimum wage remains $7.25 an hour, and many states follow that. There are only one or two states in the country where working full-time at minimum wage brings you above the federal poverty level. So I want to bring in Dr. Smith. Uh, diaper need Dr. Smith, it's been described as that invisible crisis. Many people, they may not even know their friends or their neighbors are dealing with it. In what ways does diaper need impact maternal mental health? Thank you. You, you know, um, we have a maternal mortality crisis in this country, in the U.S. Um, we're seeing um, mothers die at a higher rate than other uh, comparable countries across the, the world and black women dying two to three times um, more often than white women in pregnancy. Certainly implicit bias and, and racism play a big role in that. But an important driver of maternal mortality and maternal well-being is really maternal mental health. So things like depression and anxiety. And we found in some of our work where we partnered with the National Diaper Bank Network, um, that the maternal depression, diaper need was a large predictor of postpartum depressive symptoms. And that really has continued to come out in the diaper check work where we see high levels of depression and anxiety and stress in those families, families that are experiencing diaper needs. So I think we need to begin to think about diaper need as a key piece um, as we move to address maternal mortality in our country. Joanne, how does the National Diaper Bank Network step in to help? I mean, what have you seen working with families, particularly, you know, when it comes to diaper need and food insecurity? The only solution is for there to be federal response to this. It's the only entity that's large enough to actually address this issue. Um, you know, and when it comes to what I've seen with families, I always want to say, you know, I believe that all parents want the best for their children. And raising children is really difficult. We know that poverty is a stressor. And we know that when we're under stress, things are more difficult. So really, we're in a situation that is solvable. And we just haven't so far had the, the will from a political standpoint to make that change. Joanne Goldblum and Dr. Megan Smith, thank you for joining us here and for this important call to action. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Still ahead, we'll introduce you to a single father of four and share more on how a diaper bank in Texas gave him the gift of hope. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Infants require up to 12 diapers a day, which can cost more than $100 a month per child. But no federal government program, including SNAP and WIC, provides funding for diapers. If you're able to help families in need, scan this QR code or go to SinclairCares.com to help provide diapers to a local diaper bank. Please also reach out if your family is struggling with basic needs for your baby. In San Antonio, the Texas Diaper Bank has been around since 1997, offering major help to some of the smallest Texans, free diapers for families in need, and the whole idea here is both obvious and generous. It may make you wonder what families did before the diaper bank was ever created. David Chancellor with our sister station in San Antonio has more on this gift of hope. 
The numbers are difficult to hear, tougher to endure. Pulling from savings to buy stuff was a little painful. Nearly one out of two families in America struggle to make sure that a child is wearing a clean diaper. You heard that right, one out of two. You have someone who is working and comes in and, and needs just a little bit of assistance, and then you have those that have really, really limited resources, and they come in with their baby, and you can tell that their baby has not been changed. And they're here because they need you to provide that one diaper that's gonna make that difference in keeping their baby healthy. This is what I would expect to see. It's a Just problem a Jacob Relsick knows well. He's a single father of four children under the age of seven who admits paying for the diapers is about as tough as asking for help. I thought initially that, okay, diaper bank, charity, low grade, cheap junk perhaps, but once we tried it, it was like, uh, okay, first of all, the cost and the quality was good. And when you talk about diapers and you have to make that choice between food and diapers, sometimes diapers are not gonna win. They're not gonna be the priority. That's where the Texas Diaper Bank helps. Their warehouse is stacked, literally, with more than a million diapers, which have been collected, packaged, and then distributed to families in 18 different Texas counties. Google the numbers the Texas Diaper Bank did last year, and you'll be amazed. Over 2 million diapers raised and nearly 215,000 families helped. But here's what the numbers don't measure. Hope. They're a godsend, and they've blessed this family for four, over four years now, I think. During COVID, you and I both, all of us, couldn't find toilet paper, paper towels, things like that. They had diapers. Families can receive 25 diapers a week, 300 every three months. We never run out. The diaper bank even delivers, which is a bonus because the last thing that a parent of a newborn has enough of is time. Yeah, it's a huge relief of time, gas, you know, driving, picking them up. For us, it's very gratifying when we are able to put a package of diapers in the hands of a mom, uh, of a single dad, in the hands of a grandparent who's raising a grandchild. They come up to you and they even want to give you a hug. We know we're doing something right. David Chancellor reporting from San Antonio. Another guest joining us now, Democratic Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro from Capitol Hill. Congresswoman, it is great to have you here with us. We know that you have fought long and hard to affect change. Share with us why this particular issue, diaper need, why is it so important to you? Uh, well, it's, it's an economic issue. It really is. You, you, you know, people today live paycheck to paycheck. That's just not a, a sound bite. Um, uh, folks have not seen a, a pay increase in years. Uh, and, and what have they seen, in fact, is the uh, skyrocketing costs for essential goods, whether it's food, utility costs, housing costs, uh, goods for their kids, school supplies, uh, clothes. And in this case, you know what, uh, uh, diapers. Uh, in 2022, the cost of diapers for families each month was between $70 and $80. Uh, so you're looking at close to $900 a year. Uh, for you know, for 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 for, for diapers. So, and as, actually, um, I, I have to say that I was introduced to this issue uh, by a, a wonderful and dear friend, Joanne Goldblum, mm -hmm. of the National Diaper uh, uh, Network, and how her advocacy got right. me into this fight uh, because she knows firsthand uh, how families are struggling. Um, but critically, she knows how receiving help from the community can help them for their kids and their families to be able to thrive. Right. And that's what we need to be doing is looking at how we provide that financial stability, that economic security for families today and not put them or their kids at risk because er, we know they're not healthy. Yeah, we have we talked to her and you know, we, we heard those stories firsthand. We also want to know, tell us about the diaper bank pilot program that you helped start with the Department of Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, you know, what what we what we've done is we launched a diaper distribution demonstration and research pilot, and that is to uh, help meet a family's diaper needs, alleviate the cost burden of diapers and improve the economic security of working families. So it's $16 million has been provided to serve 12 states 
and and two on two tribes. Um, uh, the families will receive diapers, uh, uh, which alone can be about eight percent of a person's total income. But they're going to get critical support services, job training, educational support, Head Start, housing services, and more. This is for our kids, uh, and we need to fight to ensure that families do not have to sacrifice diapers or any other need of their children to be able to make ends meet. In looking at that fight, that continued fight, Representative, let's look at what you think has worked. What what doesn't work to help with this issue? What do you think needs to happen at a state and federal level, legislation perhaps? And how do we ensure parents can uh, afford diapers? Sure, a, a, a very, very good question. First, understand that when Joanne and I uh, uh, we're talking about this not that long ago. Uh, we we were told by folks. I listened to people say, "Well, if they can't afford diapers, they shouldn't have children," or that we were engaged in the nanny state. We took all kinds of criticism for uh, for getting engaged and involved in this. And now there is a national uh, a network because of understanding the need. So in order to be able to move forward, what we need to do is to say, um, a, a government that does work for working families and the vulnerable. Um, uh, and uh, uh, one of the, the ways in which I think we can move is to uh, d deal with the child tax credit, which got introduced through the American Rescue Plan, um, and which provides uh, funding uh, to, to families with kids under six at $3,600 a year, kids six to 17, uh, you know, three thousand dollars a year. One of, the, as I said, one of the most successful programs we have seen lifted uh, uh, almost fifty percent of kids out of poverty, lowered the hunger rate in the United States by uh, by a uh, twenty six percent. So I believe the child tax credit is the most effective tool that we have to fight against rising costs and ensuring that people can provide the essential goods for themselves and for their families. We thank you for being a leader in this fight, Representative Rosa Deloro. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Take care. And coming up, we'll hear from a retired man in Salt Lake City, Utah, who started a diaper bank in his garage and now donates more than one million diapers a year to families in need. Stay with us. Because you are seeing the impact the Share Baby has is doing in a local uh, community, but why not get big, go bigger? Obviously, the National Diaper Bank is doing that. Running this uh, organization and providing diapers and baby needs to our community. So I would love to see it just continue to grow. Welcome back. According to the Center for Economic and Policy Research, the poorest 20% of Americans who need to buy diapers spend nearly 14% of their after-tax income just on diapers. Sinclair Cares and the National Diaper Bank Network are helping fill the gap, and together they're getting a basic necessity, clean, dry diapers to families in every state across the U.S. If you are able to help, just scan that QR code on your screen or go to SinclairCares.com to help provide diapers to a local diaper bank. Amanda Gilbert with our sister station in Salt Lake City spoke to the Utah Diaper Bank, hearing why this is especially important right now. The Utah Diaper Drive says it costs U.S. families about $80 to $100 a month to buy diapers. It's a need that state and federal government doesn't really help with. That's why this is so important. When Victor Villavis retired... I actually was going to do a hot dog cart. He wanted to do something different. A local crisis nursery came on TV, but their clients didn't have diapers and they didn't have diapers. That's when he decided to start a nonprofit out of his garage. Why diapers? Why focus on diapers? So government agencies help with food, they help with med medicine, they help with, uh, you know, daycare, they help with clothing, job interviews, all those kinds of things. But diapers are a gap. His nonprofit grew from donating 11,000 diapers a year to 1.3 million. We started out in my house, 11,000 diapers. And Vic says more recently, KUTV helped with this success. People like KUTV made the community aware of the problem and once the community is aware of the problem once they find out no government service is actually supplying diapers for low-income families they want to help Let it go. 
Over the past two years, the KUTV Diaper Drive brought money and around 300,000 diapers to the nonprofit. They're distributed all over the Wasatch Front and more. I can't tell you how thank them much enough for what they've done. Wendy Osborne runs a food pantry in Utah called Tabitha's Way. The need is, is tremendous right now. She says clean diapers are essential. Babies don't have the immune systems that we do. But with inflation, the buying power of families' budgets have diminished. One mom at the food pantry recently lost her spouse to suicide. She was pregnant. She had small children at home. Having diapers there, having food there was a tremendous relief for her. The gratitude. Tears in their eyes. They're, they're crying. Osborne sees it firsthand. In Utah, I think our population, we have both larger families and, of course, um, everywhere has, you know, single parents. While other needs like food and medicine tend to get noticed first, it's important not to forget this. It's preserving the health of a child is what that's doing, and that's huge. In Salt Lake City, Utah, Amanda Gilbert. And now we'll hear from the executive director of a diaper bank in Buffalo, New York. Razia Hill is the executive director and founder of Every Bottom Covered. Razia, it is so great to have you here with us. What type of need are you seeing right now at your diaper bank? Uh, we are in Buffalo, and after 514, where a tragedy occurred at the Tops Market, um, we definitely see the need even elevated. Our community is primarily urban and very much so low income. We have 40% of people living in poverty in Western New York. So we understand that there is a significant need. It is only enhanced due to our trauma. Um, and also, we are still reeling from COVID. So we are. Um, still trying to pick up the pieces of that, compile with this tragedy, and then the rebuild after that. And so it's so in important to get this message out there to all those watching and listening. What is your message to them who are considering ways that they can best help? The diaper need affects the entire community. It does not just affect the family that is being served by our, our organizations. Uh, we need to remember that we are all interconnected and families are missing work, children are missing daycare opportunities. We are missing ways to stimulate our economy because families are unable to use those resources uh, for a lack of basic needs being covered. Rosie, what do you think is one of the challenges to solving this issue? From your experience, I mean, on the ground, talking to these families every single day. Uh, organizations like ours and diaper banks across the nation are definitely doing our part, but it needs to be a governmental response and a, a much more push towards funding for diaper banks. Just as we fund food and understand food insecurity, we should understand that there are other basic needs that are not being met alongside that. We should des definitely continue to champion that both on a state side, uh, on a state level, and then definitely on a federal level because there needs to be support from our government to ensure that families have a leg up in that area. And then, you know, as we've discussed, it's not just, you know, an economic issue. The, the impacts, uh, you know, to maternal health uh, on the children themselves, is that something that you're seeing? Absolutely. Uh, mothers are dealing with not only postpartum, but also just uh, depression and anxiety of not being able to supply adequate amount of diapers for their children. I think that that is something that no family should have to experience. We're also having children go to the emergency room for things that are preventable, like yeast infections and diaper rash and urinary tract infections, because they don't have a provision of clean supplies that will last enough for their family. And again, we're knowing that children can't go to daycare without extra extra diapers. Families then will keep their children at home and then they're missing work. So it's just um, a domino effect in the community. And health disparities, uh, especially ones that we can treat, we need to examine and we need to understand why it is so difficult to get in front of this. And I'm glad that you brought that up because it is something, I mean, missing work, it's something that you don't think about, uh, but it is an issue, a huge issue nonetheless. Razia Hill, thank you so much for all that you are doing and for so many families and for joining us. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for having me. A reminder, scan this QR code to help a local diaper bank provide diapers to children and families in need. And if your family is struggling with basic needs for your baby, go to SinclairCares.com. That's going to do it for us for now. From all of us at Sinclair Cares, we sincerely appreciate you watching and for helping address this diaper need in America.
from Washington, I'm Didi Gatton.